This is an ancient Indian dude with far too much time on his hands. And these guys are cutting-edge, pioneering brain scientists. Now what could they possibly have in common? Let's go back thousands of years to the ancient world. The first mystics would leave their towns, villages and everyday distractions to find solace in the forest. There, in isolation, they studied their own inner experience. As they looked within, what they found was a myriad of thoughts and emotions, just like most people would. And also, like most people, these thoughts seemed to cause anxiety and seemed to serve no real practical purpose. But with vigilant observation, the mystics found that when they stopped feeding their thoughts, they started to get quieter and quieter. They were quite literally changing their state of mind from the inside out. The mystics in India called this practice Vipassana, which means clear seeing. Today, we call it meditation. Now, fast forward to the early 2000s. Scientists studying the brain and the effect of brain exercises started to make some surprising discoveries. Brain science was still in its infancy. And in fact, up until late into the 20th century, it was still thought that the brain was solid, like concrete, unable to change in its structure. But then, they discovered a phenomenon called brain plasticity. It seemed the brain could actually change. It could be shaped and rewired by exercise. And guess what they found had the power to cause structural changes? Yep, meditation. Several studies found a whole host of structural changes in the brains of people who meditated. Here are some of the changes they found. The default mode network, which could stimulate wandering and aimless thought grooves, was quietened down. The amygdala, which processes fear and anxiety, reduced in size and activity. Grey matter in the sensory regions of the brain increased, which in turn enhanced sense perception. These were startling discoveries, and it became clear that there was something to this ancient practice after all. But it's not just neuroscience. The field of psychology also owes some recent developments to this Eastern philosophy. The mystics of old times claimed this simple fact. With regular insight, you'll see that your thoughts are not real. And the recent success of cognitive talk therapy uses this exact same strategy. The subject learns to see the falseness of their own repetitive thinking. They are simply an interpretation of what is going on, not the actuality of what's going on. So, what's the difference, you might ask? Well, say someone next to you makes a sarcastic remark. This may trigger you to start thinking about a number of possible explanations, and they could all be completely false. For example, she did that on purpose. Everyone does this to me. They're all planning to keep me down, etc. See how these thoughts lead to other thoughts which multiply with each other? The philosophy of Vipassana is to see that these thoughts are nothing more than stories in your head. And as you get better, they stop multiplying so quickly. But don't be disheartened, it takes practice. By the way, you don't necessarily have to look like a yogi or sit like a pretzel to meditate. So whether it's breathing meditation, watching meditation, dancing or fishing meditation, whatever clears your mind is a great place to start. All of these techniques contribute to a healthier mind. There is something that brain science is starting to substantiate, and it's what ancient mystics said all those years ago. In ancient times, the yogis in India intuited that bodily posture has a profound effect on a person's state. They believed that tiny channels called nadis ran through the human body, carrying through them a force called prana, life force. And it was said that if these nadis were kept aligned, the flow of prana would be smooth and unhindered, contributing to overall health, kind of like a well-oiled machine. When these nadis get impeded, energy builds up and we feel it as pressure. The idea of yoga is to counter these misalignments and bring the body back into its natural state. The yogis saw the body and mind not as separate entities, but as a single continuum, both influencing each other. So if the body was kept energetically balanced, the mind would follow suit. 
But what's the need for this, you might ask? Well, years and years of ignorance, smartphones, TV watching and poor conditioning has kicked many people's bodies out of balance and made them habitually misaligned. Could watching our posture be at least one way of countering this trend? According to Western science, the answer is yes. Here's what some studies have showed. Simply sitting up straight affects your mood to the point that you're more likely to remember positive memories as opposed to negative ones. It's also shown to reinforce confidence. Standing up straight has shown to increase testosterone levels and decrease cortisol, which is known as the stress hormone. And this may well be because certain postures, or asanas, claim to affect the organs in a positive way. So could it be that the unhindered flow of prana through the body makes us feel more inhabited, calms down a wandering mind and energizes the body? Is this another area that yogis and scientists can agree on? Another separate area of yogic study is the breath. Do you know that we breathe approximately 23,000 times a day? And for most people, these are shallow chest breaths, usually involving the intercostal muscles, especially in times of stress. But they pale in comparison to their counterpart, diaphragmatic or belly breaths, known by the yogis as Adam Pranayama. Of course, you're not actually breathing air into your stomach, but it's the diaphragm that's doing the work, not the chest muscles. This type of breathing not only improves lung function, fitness and posture, it's also said to activate the vagus nerve, triggering the parasympathetic relaxation response. This is evidence of a stunning link between breathing patterns and the nervous system. So while our society thinks mental health is confined purely to the brain, our yogic friends of olden times said that the mind and body are inseparable. Yogic practice or awareness, whether postural or breathing, does, it seems, have a profound effect on our state of being. Dopamine is the brain's feel-good chemical. In our evolutionary past, it was nature's way of rewarding certain behavior. A successful kill or procreation released dopamine in buckets, thus incentivizing his behavior further. This was natural and necessary, but today all of these release unnatural and copious amounts of dopamine through the exact same pathway. That's why they feel so good and why they're so hard to stop. They're essentially tricking our brains. But the root cause of all these addictions is even more fundamental. It's the brain's ability to fantasize. Meaningless fantasy and thinking is enjoyable purely because it spews dopamine. Some fantasies spew more dopamine than others, but the stronger and more vivid the fantasy is, the more dopamine is released. But who benefits from this? While we certainly don't, living inside of us is a dopamine monster, your demon of addiction. The monster lives on stimulation and excitement, needs it for its own survival. In many ways, it's your own worst enemy the enemy of clarity and clear insight. It has a cunning intelligence of its own, and its agenda is to keep you trapped to meaningless dopamine drives. This way, it will get its fill while leaving you listless. Have you felt the insatiable need to watch TV for hours? That's the monster impelling you to do what he wants. Have you woken up at 3 a.m. to have a quick snack? There he is again, getting a feed. In fact, the monster in one person can literally sense it in another. It's a well-known fact that addicts somehow seek and find the company of other addicts. The monster is clever, and it knows exactly what it's doing. But is there a way out? Yes, the monster relies on excitement and stimulation in many forms to survive, and in this case we're using the analogy of dopamine. But consciously denied of its food, it simply gets weaker and weaker. This is the most basic way to fight. By noticing the illusory nature of what it craves, we start to break our own addiction, and breaking one addiction helps to break all the rest. But the monster will fight back and won't let you go without a heck of a fight. This is the very same battle between consciousness and addiction that's been documented in all kinds of ancient traditions. It's not clear if these are to be interpreted allegorically or literally, but it's been the central theme of many old mythological tales. It's not easy, but the reward is equally great. When you're much less driven by the need for excitement, it paves the way for higher energies, and the world is lessening its grip on you. Well, through diligent observations, they had deep insights into our inner workings. So let's take a look at what they found. They posited 
that in all of our bodies there exists a fire, a transformative power called Agni, and whatever we eat goes through our system and gets consumed by Agni. Agni breaks it down and transforms the food into a finer substance called Ojas that can then be used to build up the body. But this only happens to the extent the food you eat is pure. When impure or harmful food is consumed, it's slightly different. The fire, or Agni, struggles and has to work harder to break it down. It can only produce a small amount of Ojas and an additional substance called Ama. Ama being untapped food is not good news. According to Ayurveda, Ama is a big reason for all of our health problems. It essentially clogs the body up and blocks the flow of prana. Deep tissues, nerve channels and major organs are places Ama can end up being deposited. But one place it finds it really easy to hide in is fat cells. Ama finds it easy to stay in body fat and Western science, in parallel, has found that body fat can harbour toxins. Ama creates a biochemical environment in the body that breeds errant emotions. In the previous video, we used the analogy of a dopamine monster. Well, they love these kind of conditions and deposit themselves in several parts of the body. They also stimulate cravings for further junk food, so the whole thing can self-propagate and grow. It can become a vicious cycle. Clearly, food and emotional state are profoundly connected. The fire will try its best to burn up Ama, and given enough time, it will do it. But if it's consistently bombarded with the wrong kind of diet, it will get exhausted. The fire will get weaker and weaker. One primary way to reverse it is to change the diet and give the fire of Agni time to restore itself to full health. So, we mentioned that the quality of foods affects Agni greatly. Well, the yogis divided food into three groups, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Sattvic is the most conducive to yogic and bodily balance, but in today's society it's a challenge to not fall into Tamasic food, fast food and ready-made stuff fall into this category. They all damage the fire. Ultimately, our bodily intuition will know what category of food falls into and will guide us. So here are several things that the yogis found affect Agni. Tamastic food creates Ama, which can overburden the fire. Eating too much food in general overburdens the fire. Eating too little can cause the fire to dwindle and weaken. Wrong posture while eating can compromise the fire working properly. Probiotic foods are said to strengthen Agni. Wrong food combinations can do the same, so you have to experiment to be sure. It's possible that for some, grains are unhealthy and can overburden the system. See the Chinese Bigu diet. All of these can create the aforementioned conditions. Often, the bodily intelligence will inform us as to the effect of a food. We call this precious faculty instinct. Have you ever seen an overweight cow? A depressed rhino? No. These creatures are running on instinct and are largely free of emotional input. It's only humans that have emotional cravings. So as well as our natural instinct as to what is good and healthy, we also have this figurative monster which craves what it desires. People say their eating disorders seem to be run by demons. In a sense, that's probably true. But the more we can break this bond, we will naturally invigorate the fire of Agni and the inner conditions will be more conducive to a yogic state of mind. Do the events of your past run through your mind like an old cassette player? The past thoughts can seem like a steel chain sometimes holding us back and not letting us move forward. But the first thing to notice is that these very past thoughts don't exist anywhere except in your own head. They're your own doing. And this video will show you that you are not the past and it doesn't have to dictate you. Now the past may seem like an unvanquishable foe, but the truth is it's just a trick of our own brain. More accurately said, it's a habit of our brains. The past is just a habit. And for this very reason, it's also something we can break. We have the tendency to replay events of the past in thought grooves, the scientific term for this being a neural pathway. Particularly traumatic events can be played back again and again, each time keeping the neural pathway alive. The question is, why does this happen? And the short answer is, it's just a habit of our brain. 
So you can see that it's not your past that you have to overcome in itself. It's just your mind and emotional patterns you have to overcome. Our friend here is sitting in his apartment. He can hear the rain outside. He can see the light of the lamp as well as all the details in his room. Thoughts about his past are simply not necessary in this moment. They're useless to him. They don't tell him anything he needs to know and he can't act on them. In fact, they're nothing more than just entertainment. By simply not thinking about the past, by resisting the temptation to think about it, we start to unravel the past. And as we become more present, the neural pathways actually start to fade and die. So it may feel a bit strange at first, but the way to get over the past is not to analyze or dissect it. It's just to simply be present with the past. This of course means not thinking about the past, but just allowing the past into the present. Thinking about the past actually keeps it where it is. So why is this so hard to do? Well, the past is actually a living emotional monster. It does not like the present moment one bit, simply because it can't survive there, which is why it constantly wants to keep us distracted. The more present we are with it, though, the weaker it gets. As the past is a habit, we have to break habits in order to break the past. And the body's actually always trying to throw the past out. But to do that, it needs our help. It needs the right conditions. So the first thing to do while the body is getting rid of the past is to not create any more past, not to make the past any stronger, which would work against the body's natural efforts. Breaking all of these habits as much as we can will create the environment in which the past can be broken. And this means vicious cycles have to stop for example, if we escape from the past habitually by spending too much time in technology, this has to be broken too. So we're bringing an end to the addictive behaviors as mentioned in Science of Yoga 3. But for the deeper traumatic parts of our past, we have to do something else. In yogic texts, deep past problems are known as deep armor. This was mentioned in a previous video. We have to create a biochemical environment in which armor can be let go of. And this means being very careful about what we put into the system. Anything inflammatory will simply impede the process and slow it down. In some cases, it can halt the process as long as the inflammation continues. With the correct environment, an energy that runs through the body called prana or life force will simply take care of all the past toxins. This is one way of rooting out the past. If we were to create an unfavorable environment within the body, the past can simply stay hidden. So the idea with this is to create in an environment in which there are no hiding places. So while it's often about facing and letting go of the past, we also cannot ignore the physical environment we're creating in the body. As we start to break the habit of thinking of the past, we'll also simultaneously break the future thinking habit because the future in our heads is just a modified version of the past. Both are unnecessary and illusory as each other. Both are in fact completely dispensable. So as we do all of this, the neural pathways of our brain start to change. The past is not seen as much of a problem. The great monster is not as intractable as it seemed. This is how we rise above the past. To explain karma, let's take the story of a man called Joseph. Now, Joseph has fantasies about getting rich too quickly. He has these wild visions of freedom and is frustrated with his life as it is. So he went online and started to make deals with people, offering him almost too good to be true, get rich quick schemes. And Joseph then invests a lot of money into each of these schemes and waits patiently for their return. Days and weeks go by. Now Joseph is getting impatient and decides to follow up on all of his leads, but to his horror he realizes that he's been scammed, shortchanged. In fact, every investment he made turned out to be a farce. So he thinks to himself, this is just bad karma. Everyone I deal with ends up being a fake. And his mind immediately externalizes the problem. It makes it seem like he's the victim here and the perpetrators are out there. But if we take a closer look, at the problem, there is a very important lesson to be learned, which is of course not out there, but is within Joseph. Namely, it was he who had fantasies about getting rich too quickly, and it was this that made him weak, beguiled, easily manipulable. He was therefore e easy pickings for the manipulators out there 
just like a wolf can smell a wounded sheep from miles afar. So the average brain always looks outside and blames what's happening out there for its problems, but will avoid at almost any cost looking back at itself to see the original cause. And this applies in some ways to most of our problems. Of course, there are bad things out there, but the question is, what are we doing in relation to them? As soon as Joseph comes to his senses and sees the truth of his own beguilement, he'll have learnt his lesson. Once Joseph stops getting lost in fantasies and sees things more clearly, suddenly the wolves out there start to disappear. They can't smell any blood anymore. And Joseph decides now to take a much more measured and concrete approach. So... What is it that makes us different from robots? Yogis have said for thousands of years that we all have an Atman, a soul which goes beyond the physical body. But how exactly did they arrive at this conclusion? The question of consciousness is a fundamental one, but objective scientists have struggled with it. Science looks out at the phenomenal world and sees objects, the natural world, living creatures, etc. It makes a conceptual model of them, based on thought. And this is how we got the sciences. Biology, physics, chemistry, and so on. Each day our understanding grows and refines itself. We call this scientific advancement. But when it comes to consciousness, things are not easy. Science itself acknowledges consciousness as the hard problem. It simply can't understand it. For example, when a bird sings, we know that the sound travels into our ear and then the auditory regions of the brain which process it. But this is just the mechanism of how sound enters the brain. It doesn't explain the consciousness that hears it. Why hasn't the scientific mind ever been able to solve this? Well, the answer is, the scientific mind was always looking the wrong way. It's looking out there, when consciousness is the very ground of who we are. You could say that it's the ineffable part of us, behind our thought process, so the mind can never and will never understand it. It can't comprehend it. The yogic approach is not to look out there, but instead to still the mind as much as possible, making it as quiet as possible. And when it's still enough, consciousness as their true identity becomes self-apparent. So the yogis were able to make this wonderful assertion that their identity is consciousness. In today's world, in the high ranks of academia, and the top universities across the planet. Material sciences say that humans are purely mechanical beings and that the spiritual part of us doesn't exist. The truth is, of course, that this is itself a mental concept in the mind of the materialist. It's the mind making yet another conceptual model. To be our true identity, say the yogis, it's this very mind that we have to quieten down. Then the truth emerges by itself, and it's this truth that inspired many of the great religions. It wasn't just yogis. Mystics all over the world discovered this. They just had different names for it. It is beyond any conceptual thought and beyond the grasp of the science.